So if the real estate, if it's good real estate, it's good location, you can get it at a good basis, get it at a good price per pound, et cetera. Um, don't get hung up on, gee, the short-term borrowing cost is, and I can only borrow uh, 50% instead of 70%. My name is Jesse Vergallen. You're listening to Working Capital. My guest today is Peter Linneman of the CEO and founder of Linneman Associates. And uh, Peter is a returning guest. Uh, we had him back on the show uh, not too long ago, but we were talking before a lot is changing in the commercial and residential real estate world that I uh, thought we'd have you back on, Peter, and we could chat a little bit about the environment we're in and, uh, and you know, any crystal balling you have for the future. How are you doing today? I'm doing terrific. How about yourself? I'm doing great. Um, thanks uh, for coming back on the podcast. Uh, for those that haven't seen or listened to that first episode, you can check that out online, uh, wherever you listen to the podcast or YouTube. Um, and uh, also for people that don't know, uh, you know, Peter, it's uh, you're pretty well known in most commercial real estate offices as kind of writing the, the Bible and real estate. Um, and that's the uh, the finance book, uh, Peter. You'll you'll be able to give me the full title of it, but uh, it's pretty much the the blue Bible. That if you're taking some sort of uh, real estate or real estate finance course, that that's going to be uh, that's going to be mandatory reading. Yeah, just it's called real estate finance and investments, risk and opportunities. It's been around now for a long time in various editions. I don't even know what edition we're on. Bruce Kirsch has joined me as authoring it. And uh, it's called the Blue Bible. I have nothing to do with that. It's because the book covers have been blue always over the years of slightly different shades. So um, I didn't know it was even called the Blue Bible until it had been out about five years. And people came up to me and started saying that. And I go, oh, so I guess it's an honor. You know what? It's funny. The uh, the book, at least the way I came to that book, is that when I uh, started investing in real estate, the there was kind of a difference between the 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 you know what you would get in school in terms of the the background and types of investment uh, in real estate, and then what you would get at actual uh, books that are geared towards real estate investing. And I found I found that there wasn't much overlap between the two. And when I found you, uh, I think your book, I, I think it was in my MBA that the first time I saw your book and in first year. And it was a real estate finance and infrastructure course. It was the first book I saw that was almost speaking the investor's language uh, in terms of real estate while still giving a kind of the overview of, of commercial real estate. Was that was that intentional with that book? That you well, you know, it's funny. That book was, I never intended to write that book. Um, I would design books for my class. I was never happy with the books for the reason you're saying. And I had a couple of tremendous uh, juniors who had taken my course and had aced it and were really great and hardworking. I said to them in their senior year, well, why don't you just record the lectures and then we'll just have those as notes. Well, the written word is very different than the spoken word. So then I worked like hell. They were great helping me to get it to the point where it was a written version. Then I said, well, now that we have a written version, gee, I guess we ought to publish it and let it be used. It was literally my course with the difference being it went from a spoken word to a written word, which is very different. You know, if you took this transcript, which I think makes great sense as we're talking, but you read it, it makes less sense. So you had to do that. But I never understood why the textbooks were so stilted because you can be quite rigorous, but also quite straightforward. It's, it, and, and so that, it, it was intended to be insightful. That's about all that was intended to be. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, helpful, yeah. helpful and insightful. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny the you know, different inflection, the different way people speak when you're talking, you know, reading that is, it doesn't really translate completely, but I, you know, there's been a number of different, uh, um, I, I guess more on the academic side, a number of different uh, authors that have taken transcripts of different lectures and then and then kind of move that towards uh, an actual book. And, I, you know, it sounds like it's just as easy as just taking the transcripts, but it sounds like there's there's more work to that. No, it's not. It was funny, though. 
people who know me well or people who sat through and suffered through me a lot said it's the same with liniment leather is that they say i can hear your voice as i read it yeah and i'm not sure that's a blessing but it's true you know um sam zell bless his soul um uh was a dear friend and he did his autobiography i think it's called my being too subtle or yeah. something if you haven't read it it's a great, it's great book great fun great insight if you knew sam you can hear him i mean you can truly hear him yes it's a written document so if you don't know his voice you and the way he talked and the way he explained things you can't hear it so someone who never has heard me it's just a book but I'm in the same way, Lineman Letter. It's just a written thing. But if you know or you're used to hearing it, you go, oh, yeah, I can hear his voice again, for better or worse. You know, it's funny you mentioned uh, Sam Zell because that uh, I, the, I never read that book uh, in, the, in the written format. I, I listened to the audio book and I was actually yeah. somebody's like, oh, you know, I can't. One of the brokers I work with is like, ah, oh, you got to listen to that voice, though, because he self narrates it. I'm like, what do you mean? That's that's the that's why I bought it. I was like, I want to hear that voice. That's the only way like you connect yeah. with that, uh, you know, his style of, of speaking. That's a, a just a small little story. You know, Sam had tried to have someone ghostwrite an autobiography of him and, and they were a very good writer and they tried for about two, I don't know, two years or three years and they did all the normal stuff and it just went nowhere because it wasn't Sam, uh, because he was very hard to capture. So he finally decided to just dictate. And then again, they had to go from spoken word to written word, which is some work, but but it did come out sounding like Sam. So then they said, well, you know, we need to do an audio book. And Sam said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll record it. I don't, I, I don't have the patience to record my own, but Sam did. And I think it was one of the great, it's one of the great treasures that Sam left behind. I encourage anybody to read it, but if, I think you're right, even more fun is to listen to it because Sam had such a unique voice yeah. and he had it his whole life, or at least I knew him for 33 years and, it wasn't something that just came in old age, his mm -hmm. voice. Yeah. Well, um, so Peter, we, uh, we're in an interesting market to say the least in commercial real estate. Uh, you know, if you just Google commercial real estate news, um, you know, it seems like the sky is falling in a lot of different areas. Uh, the doom loop is, is constantly being thrown around. Um, how do you assess, you know, with your historical kind of, you know, you've been, you've gone through these cycles before. Uh, how do you assess the, you know, the place that we're currently in right now? And, and what is that place? I mean, from, from your vantage point. Well, I think you're saying I've been through cycles before is a very kind way of saying I'm old. Um, and that's a very discreet way you said it. But I have. Um, I think you have to separate the two components, though. One is rent and occupancy. So let's start off with that. And the other is capital flows. And as you know, real estate is about both, right? It's, it's about the rent and occupancy, if you will, and operating costs, but let's just call it rent and occupancy. And it's also about how the market, the capital market values those. The interesting thing is that rent and occupancy, uh, quite good for apartments. Rent and occupancy, quite good for industrial. Rent and occupancy, quite good for good retail. Not good for bad retail, but it's never been that great for bad retail. But for good retail, I think you'd agree. Rent and occupancy is quite good for good retail. Rent and occupancy for hospitality, quite good. And getting better fast, right, as the recovery continues. And you'd say, oops, but for office, rent and occupancy are a struggle, right? So for most of real estate, um, rent and occupancy part, quite good. Demand is pretty strong. Supply is not out of control. Um, absorption is good. Uh, and I say the exceptions are weak retail and um, uh, office. And particularly what the 
the uh, commodity office building that's seen its occupancy go from 60% to 40%. And four years ago, somebody had a pro forma that it was going to go from 60% to 90%. But in fact, it went from 60, to, you know, the properties I'm talking about, right? Yes. It went from 60% to 40%. Those are awful. Those are really awful. Um, if you're talking in the dense urban context, I'm going to stay with rent and occupancy on office a moment. Um, if you were really brutally honest, a lot of those buildings were in trouble 10 years ago. If you and I would have been chatting 10, 12 years ago, mm -hmm. we'd have said those buildings are in trouble. A lot of them are sort of technically obsolete. They're not getting any younger their locations aren't as good, the design's not as good. And I'll take for, I know you're a different market, but take for example, a midtown, mid block uh, office building built in the 1910s, right? Now, uh, th that's not the only thing. They were in a lot of trouble, though, it, 10, 12 years ago, they were in a lot of trouble. What saved them? the hope that WeWorks was going to re, uh, rent every available footage in the market. And so there was this false dawn in rent and occupancy for weaker buildings in particular, or mediocre buildings in particular. Because as WeWork, let's, as you know, originally WeWork and their ilk took the weakest space because those landlords would say something's better than nothing, right? And then eventually they moved into some of the better buildings, but that made it harder for the tenants that normally would have been in the better buildings to get in the better buildings and that pushed down to some of the weaker, right? So if you go back five years ago, WeWorks is gonna take all the space in the world. Um, if I see a 60% occupied building, it's gonna be a 90% occupied was the narrative. Well, WeWorks is gone. I mean, for all intents and purposes, there always is going to be a boutique uh, sublease space available. There's always been that. But as a general phenomenon, it's kind of gone. And you say, oh, gee, all that space comes back on the market. And who's it hit hardest? The weakest buildings. And it's going to hit them with a vengeance because those buildings are 10 years older and they're 10 years less cared for. And so 12 years ago, we would have said it was gonna go from 60% occupancy to 45% occupancy. It went from 60 or, you know, 60 to 70, and now it's back down to 40. That's where it was going anyway, on its way to irrelevance. So it's important to understand that WeWorks created a supply demand Let's face it, one investor, one investor, really, right? SoftBank mm -hmm. created a false dawn in rent and occupancy, and that false dawn is gone. You add to that what COVID did, which is, I don't know, who's going back to the office? How many days a week are they going back to the office? Do I need as much space? And no one knows the answer to that. Literally, no one. Mm -hmm. A lot of speculation, but no one knows. You're going, okay, office supply demand fundamentals are back to where they kind of were, plus this work from home overhang issue. So office is in a very questionable situation. It's not going to disappear, but the question is how much of it disappears, right? And the answer could be lots of it or not very much. You know the better stuff will survive, right? You just don't know how long that, that process takes. So that would be the rent and occupancy world. And I think you'd come away in general saying rent and occupancy and, and real estate in good shape, mm -hmm. right? With these exceptions of bad retail really bad office and office. Now let's go to the capital markets. Mm -hmm. The capital markets are in disarray. Why are the capital markets in disarray? 
Um, they're in much more disarray than I would have thought they'd have been a year ago. A year ago, I was saying that by early 2023, the capital markets will be finding their footing. Why are they in huge disarray versus what I originally thought? Because I originally thought the Fed would raise rates from around zero, which they never should have been at. But that's all right. That's what they were. And I thought they'd gradually raise it to about three and a half percent, three percent, some number like that, which, by the way, if inflation steadies out at two to three percent, a short term rate of three to three and a half makes sense. Right. And instead of doing it gradually and instead of taking it to three to three and a half percent, they took it to five percent, essentially five and a five and a quarter overnight, fastest raise ever. That caught out anybody who depended on what the Fed had said. Because months before they started that, they said, we're going to be in no hurry to raise rates. And then they did the fastest rate increase ever. So they wrong-footed anybody who believed them. And of course, who believed them? And the answer is the entire financial system, more or less. And in particular, banks. Banks live on borrowing short, lending long. And if you've got a positively sloped yield curve, that kind of works. When you raise the short end, 525 basis points in 12 months, it doesn't work anymore. It doesn't work. So what happened was, and I never dreamed that a year ago, I never dreamed they would have done that um, as fast as they did or as high as they did. And what that did was take the entire financial system that relied on short term money, which is banks, and turned them upside down. And so the regional banks saw their portfolios go underwater in an honest mark to market world. So they're not gonna be able to lend a lot. By the way, if the rate was three to three and a half percent, their portfolios wouldn't be underwater. They'd still be able to lend. But at five and a quarter, their portfolio is underwater. So it's hard for them to lend. They're just swimming to stay afloat. The big money center banks have a lot of reserves. So yes, they had the same phenomena, but they have more reserves to deal with. But their situation is not so dissimilar. So that, that whipsaw the entire financial system in a way we've never seen before, because we never saw such a fast rate increase before. And especially such a fast rate increase after they said, we're not going to raise them. Remember that they said we're not going to raise them and we're not in any hurry to raise them. Last time they said it, it took nine years to increase them, okay? And it's kind of crazy if you think about it because during those nine years, we had no inflation. Interest rates were very low. You would have thought the Fed would have learned empirically there's no relationship to speak of between interest rates and inflation, right? Because... If interest rates being low caused inflation, the 2010s would have had soaring inflation, mm. right? But they didn't because for nine years, they kept the rate at basically zero and there was no inflation. So they whipsawed the whole market. Anybody then who depended on banks, which certainly real estate does, is frozen. Right now, multifamily a bit less because Freddie and Fannie are there. So a bit less um, life companies. So the higher quality products a bit less. But anybody who relies on short term money like development crushed, mm -hmm. just crushed. Um, so what you have going on is banks trying to stay alive, and they are the main capital source for real estate. Banks trying to stay alive, back to Sam Zell. Remember his statement, stay alive till 95? 
Essentially, yeah. what the banks are doing is stay alive until the interest rates 3.5. Yeah. And when the interest rates 3.5, those banks are back alive and they'll be able to do. And the question is, how long does it take for the Fed to move the interest rate to 3.5? And that would be my mantra is the banks have to stay alive until the rate is 3.5. And um, until then, it's going to be challenging. That doesn't mean every bank is underwater. It just means lots of them don't have much wiggle room. And, and my research and common sense says that when money flows, real estate values are buoyant, mm -hmm. as long as rent and occupancy are good. And when money doesn't flow, values are not buoyant, right? And what do you have happen? Be it's... By the way, it happened before because of different causes, but anytime money doesn't flow, values aren't buoyant. Markets dry up. So what we have are large bid-ask spreads and um, not much transaction volume, as you know. Mm -hmm. And um, the transaction market is a bit like, take somebody who has a good industrial property or a good retail property, or a good multifamily property. They financed it in 2000, what? 2021, let's say. And they put on seven to 10 year debt. They're cash flowing enormously, right? Because of when they put that on. NOI is up since they put the loan on and they fixed. And they had like one six coverage. And now comes along somebody who says, well, I'll buy it from you, but at 100 basis points higher cap rate than a year ago. What do you think the sellers are going to say? Yeah. Piss off. Kick rocks. I'll, I'll, I'll take my cash flow. Thank you very much. Why yeah. would I sell into a market that I know is distressed? If I'm not distressed, I'll take my cash flow. I believe that when capital markets resume normality, I stay alive until the rate is 3.5. If I can stay alive until the rate's 3.5, then banks come back to lending, capital markets free up. When capital markets free up, transactions happen. When transactions happen, bid ask come down, bid ask narrow, and they narrow by the bid coming back down close to the ask. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of captures the capital market side of it. The good news is, except for office and bad retail, the operating side, the rent and occupancy is in good shape. Mm -hmm. We have seen times like, like the 8081, uh, 73, 74, um, 2009, 10, 11, where they were both in terrible shape at the same time, right? Where both the operating metrics and the capital market metrics were in terrible shape. That's not the case here with the exceptions we said. So, so the goal becomes stay alive till the rate's 3.5. I like that. Um, I was thinking stay alive till 25, but I guess that's, uh, we'll see where, where that 3.5 is. I, a question I was listening to, I think it was Barry Stern, like uh, uh, formerly at Starwood that uh, I was on uh, Forbes. It was a YouTube uh, video recently. I think it was him that was, uh, that w said this stat and it was that, the exposure to specifically office real estate in the United States for banks is 1.5% of their total balance sheet in terms of lending. Do you know if, if that, if that's rough, because I guess his point was that you see the sky is falling in the news, but then when you look at the actual exposure and obviously not, not all of the hundred percent is, is going to have issues. So it's an even smaller percentage. Um, do you know, uh, if that's kind of I don't know the number off the top of my head. I do know that the spirit is right. That, you know, take for example the housing bubble, you know, where first of all, in the housing bubble, just to put it in contrast, residential mortgages are a multiple of what office mortgages would be, right? I mean, just a, off the top of my head, probably 10 times 
what office mortgage is outstanding or nine times what office mortgages are. So by relative standards, and by the way, throw in bad retail, right? Just to make the, you know, uh, and by the way, not all the office is bad. So, but let's just say that it's all troubled. It's a small compared to what we had in the housing bubble as we worked that through. Secondly, remember that the housing bubble was, was a situation where not only was it a much bigger magnitude, people were borrowing 98%, 90, 98, yeah. 99%, right? And um, that wasn't true in the office market. There's an equity cushion out there. Now you may say that values have fallen enough that it's wiped out the equity cushion, but back with the housing, there were a whole lot of borrowers where a 1% or 2% or 3% drop in value wiped out the equity cushion. Not for everybody, but for a whole lot of borrowers. There's no borrower on an office building, none, that a one, two, three, five percent drop in value wiped out their equity cushion. The equity cushions tended to be 25 to 35 percent. So the losses aren't going to be as bad. Are there going to be losses? Yes. I think the losses are going to stem more from this false dawn that, that we discussed mm -hmm. than, than the actual underlying situation. And that we got, if, if WeWorks had never occurred, if SoftBank, if, if Matsua had never met uh, Adam Newman, I think the office market would have gradually drifted rent and occupancy where a whole bunch of those buildings would be irrelevant. And what's had to happen is, as WeWorks disappeared and their brethren, a whole lot of space quickly becomes available. And that's always much tougher to digest, particularly given it's going on with this work from home puzzle, if you will. So, Peter, on, on that point, if, uh, you know, the lockdowns never occurred, we don't go through what we've done, what we have in the last few years, you would have you would have made the assumption that just in virtue of these co-working spaces, we work and, and the like, there would have been that upward pressure on vacancy rates. Absolutely. Absolutely. And by the way, I don't want to say I told you so, but I was among, I wasn't the only one, but I was among the people who are were in writing and in, you know, said on the record, I just don't see it. I see it as a little niche thing, but I don't see it. And you know, I'm on the board of a major office company. We were very overt about not taking on those people as tenants because we just thought there was a day of reckoning coming. Community EBITDA was my was my favorite term. And, yeah, that's uh, great. That's yeah. every yeah, every bullshit cycle has uh, as a, a memorable term, right? That's that's a good one. Yeah. Um, so I want to be mindful of uh, of the time here, Peter. But in terms of from a forward looking perspective uh, and opportunities uh, in in what we're going through right now, uh, the three point five percent. That's that, I, I like that. That's an interesting uh, kind of view of it in terms of how we could potentially navigate these waters. Um, but I mean, just generally speaking, uh, it sounds like you're you're fairly glass half full uh, on on our industry and and per, per, perhaps what the future holds. So could you talk a little to that? Two things, more than half full because it's a long-term asset. So even if we had a recession in the next 18 months, and I don't think we do, I think there's so much pent up economic demand for automobiles, still for housing, for travel and tourism, for healthcare, um, I, I, I just think that there's so much pent up demand that it outweighs whatever the Fed's doing to the economy. Remember the Fed's efforts to slow the economy by raising interest rate. The Fed has not laid anybody off as they've rate in, raised interest rates. The federal government is not saying, oh, interest rates are up, we have to lay off workers, right? That's not how they work. 
That's not how they rule, right? And so the state, local, and federal governments pretty immune to short-term interest rates increases. What else is pretty immune? I don't know. Like if your wife was pregnant four months ago, she didn't go, oh, I'm going to keep the baby in my womb an extra five months until the rates come down. I'm, I'm going to defer going in and delivering the baby or no one's saying I'm not going to get open heart surgery because the rates are up. Healthcare, pretty immune to short term rates. That's 18 percent of the economy. Those two sectors are 53 percent of the economy, basically immune to short term rate movements. You add to that all the people who never borrow, which is a lot of consumers who never borrow, never borrow. And that includes people who run up credit card bills, but they pay them off before there's any interest on them. It's a convenience matter, not a true credit charge. And it, 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 so you take a lot of businesses don't borrow. So when you take the businesses who don't borrow and the consumers who don't borrow, and you put in items like healthcare, government, toilet tissue, um, et cetera, you may only have 20% of the economy sensitive to short-term interest rates. Yes, banks, yes, construction, yes, auto purchases for many people who are borrowing to buy a car, right? But the economy just isn't that sensitive to interest rates. Um, and by the way, if low interest rates cause huge economic growth, the 2010s would have been a huge growth period. Right, because the interest rate was zero. So I, the, you have to be aware of that. So I feel good about the economy. Um, and I always feel good about the U.S. economy long term, always. And a real estate is a bet on the long term. You may only want to invest in it for two years, but it's a bet on the long term. And I feel very good about the long term. Uh, I think we may have talked about this last time. I'm 72. And you can always come up with 10 horrible things about the U.S. and the U.S. economy. I mean, really horrible things. Our kids can't add. They think Mexico is our neighbor to the north. Um, that, you know, we have the budget deficit because we and we're not getting our money's worth on government spending. I mean, we could go on and on. Right. The war in the Ukraine. The, the, there's always horrible things. And yet. And yet the economy grows, yet the economy grows. And so don't bet against the economy. So I'm bullish in that sense. What we have is an odd capital market. It's not the first time, but every time we've had an odd capital market, come back two years from now and it's resolved. And there's nothing magic to do. Sometimes come back six months later and it's resolved. Okay, sometimes it took three years. But come back and capital market abnormalities resolve. Money flows again. When money flows again, values rebound. And when values rebound, um, uh, the markets get more liquid, et cetera. So I feel very good. And in fact, my advice to people, including what I'm advising myself is if a deal only fails to make sense because of today's capital market oddity, figure out a way to do it. So if the real estate, if it's good real estate, it's good location, you can get it at a good basis, get it at a good price per pound, et cetera. Um, don't get hung up on, gee, the short-term borrowing cost is, and I can only borrow 50% uh, instead of 70%, and that makes the return on equity look lower. You know what? My research shows that in such times, capital market disarray, you're gonna look back seven and 10 years later and say, I should have done more of it. Not that you should have done less. I should have done more. I wish I had found more equity. I wish I would have believed that the capital market disarray disappears. It would be a challenge out of the box. 
but I wish I had done more. 73, 74, capital market disrupt, 80, 81, 82, I wish I had done more. 90 through 94, I wish I had done more. Um, uh, the Russian ruble crisis was short, but I wish I had done during that. Uh, after 9-11, I wish I had done more. Uh, 2009, 10, 11, I wish I had done more. And by the way, I wish I had done, I did some stuff in um, the first eight months of COVID. I wish I had done more. I wish I had done more. Um, and I think I'm really gonna wish I had done more eight years from now. Um, and I think the same thing is true. Finding the courage to do more is hard and finding the equity you need is hard. I was on a call with a very astute uh, multifamily owner developer and they said, you know, people are looking for um, uh, six return, uh, six yields on cost on development. And I said, I know how they're getting there. They're getting there by saying, okay, I need a 15% IRR. If I can only borrow this much money and I can borrow it at this rate, then I need a certain price before I can get my 15. Don't look at it that way. If you're borrowing less money, the return on equity should go down because it's not as risky. Look at it as there's a temporary situation. I need to put in more equity. I will put it in, the return on equity is lower if the world never adjusts, if the world never adjusts. But the capital markets always adjust over a seven to 10 year period. And I'm gonna look back and say, I wish I'd have done it. And you know, I'll take the most, probably the most famous trade was Blackstone uh, doubling, you know, they had bought equity yeah. office at the peak. They made their money by buying their debt back in the teeth of the financial crisis. And how did they make money on that? They bought their debt at a huge discount and then refinanced as capital markets readjusted. They over equitized, if you will, and I'm sure that in a pro forma sense, the return on equity went down. But in so doing, they set themselves up to take advantage of the normalization of capital markets. And yes, it took two or three years for capital markets to renormalize. And people forget that those trades exist. But it's a dynamic thought process rather than a uh, what mechanical pro forma. My guest today has been Peter Linneman. Peter, thank you for being part once again of Working Capital. My pleasure. Have a great day.